this fourth Thermal Life webinar, which is organized together with the European Confederation of Institutes of Internal Auditing, ECIIA. My name is Tiffen, I am the CEO of Ferma, and I'm very pleased to moderate this session together with Pascal van den Busch, who is the Secretary General of ECIIA. Please note that you are always welcome to join the discussion by Twitter using the hashtag at Ferma webinar or by leaving your question in the chat box, which will appear on the bottom left of your menu. So today's topic is dedicated to the impact of the General Data Protection Regulation, also called the GDPR, over corporate governance. So we will see the consequences for the role of risk manager and internal auditor at least one year after its implementation. So we hope that this webinar will help you to understand how risk managers and internal auditors have been involved in the implementation of the GDPR, but also what has been the impact on the interaction between the DPO, which is a data protection officer, the internal auditor, and the risk manager. Also, we will try to come up with some recommendations and best practices, thanks to our two experts present today, um, in order to see how can um, data protection uh, be uh, improved in your organization. Next slide, please. So before we start, I will just give you a short overview on the GDPR and where we stand. So you all know that the GDPR has been enforced in May uh, 2018. And we've seen that there's been a variety of breaches, but also fines that have occurred across Europe, which, which can be ranged from big corporates such as Google, Facebook, Marriott, but also small companies. So one year after the implementation of the GDPR, we can say that no organization using personal data from EU citizens can avoid compliance and accountability. And it's against this background that FERMA and ECIIA have decided to work together to see what has been the impact of the GDPR on our both profession and the corporate governance together. So Pascal, I'm now turning to you so that you can uh, say a little bit more about our initiative. Hi everyone, so thank you for joining us. Already 157 people, so that's good. Thank you Tiffan, thank you everybody. So the survey has been performed by ECIA and FERMA. We had in total 346 participants in different countries in Europe. We also conducted about 25 interviews and all the results are included in the guidance that you can find on our website and also the one of FERMA. And maybe there is one question that you may ask, and this is why did we decide to make a survey together? Actually, the European Commission has decided to make an evaluation report of this new regulation. It should be issued in May 2020, and we thought that it would be very useful to be able to explain to the Commission what are the roles of the two professions, how important corporate governance is. And this is also the reason why in the report you have two main parts. The first one is about the recommendation, not just for the practitioners, but also for the Commission and for the governing body, because it's also important that the board and audit and risk committee understand what are the roles of internal audit and risk management and how we can help them in complying with this regulation. And in the second part of the report, you can find all the results of the survey and the interview that are divided in different areas. Tiffen, the floor is yours. So, as I was mentioning, we are very pleased to have two experts with us today. Uh, Lena Ritz, who is a Chief Risk Officer and Team Leader of the Danish uh, public-owned company EnergyNet, and Ralph Erold, who is the Senior Vice President, Corporate Audit at, at BASF, a German company. So, Lena and Ralph, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. 
Next slide, please. So, because you know that with our webinar, we always want to be interactive, uh, we have prepared a couple of polling questions that we would like to ask to you, the audience. And what we will do is that we will compare your answers with the findings of our survey, and then we will ask our experts to comment and to share the experience related to each of the topics that we will be addressing. So we will start the webinar with one first polling question addressed to you, which is, uh, which is appearing on your screen right now. What we would like to know is in your company, do you have a DPO, a data protection officer, which is a function which is internal to your company, or if it's an outsourced function? If it is an internal function, is it someone who was already in the company and it has merged with an existing function? Or is the DPO a newly um, created function? So you will have a couple of seconds now to, to respond. Okay, so we will close the polling and we will see what you have responded. Okay, so we can see that the major, for the majority of you, it's an internal function. So I would say the great majority, it's an internal function. Um, and it's split between a new function and an existing function. So it really reflects the findings of um, our survey. And next slide, if we can show the results of our survey, for which we had 82% of the respondents who were saying that it's an internal function and mainly assigned to an existing function for 53% of the cases. And if so, the DPO sits in the legal compliance department for half of the cases. Um, so I'm now turning to Lenne. Um, at EnergyNet, um, how is it organized? Is the DPO sitting within your company or are you outsourcing this function? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> Our DPO is uh, outsourced uh, to uh, legal um, uh, office. And internally, we then have a DPO advisor. We have a group of company uh, which have uh, the, their own responsibility for the GDPR risks, and they can seek advice at the internal DPO advisor, who is then connected to the outsourced uh, DPO. That's how we, uh, we find it works for us in the company. Okay. And um, why did you feel the need to have two, uh, to split basically the responsibilities into two people? Um, I suppose there are many reasons. Uh, one, of, uh, one of them is that we are now a group of uh, companies which have the, the risks uh, responsibility of GDPR individually, and they need to have a source for uh, advisors, uh, which don't have the final um, responsibility for the reporting. So we make sure that uh, this uh, DP, GDPR uh, reporting is coming from outside the company to more support the thought of corporate governance and uh, the defense lines. Okay, okay, very interesting. And I'm now turning to you, Ralph. What is the situation uh, at BASF? We purposely define the DPO on European level. European responsible for all legal entities in Europe as if legal entities. And it is coincidentally is with the headquarters here, but which means the main establishment got the DPO on European level. With this, we mirror basically the supervisor organization of the authorities. 
because the main establishment, this officer is responsible then for Europe to talk to the other authorities, which makes it later in the communication and the type of safe standards very effective. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, next slide, I think we will turn to the next question. So, curling question number two. Now that we know that most of you have a DPO, we would be interested to know what's the interaction that you have with the DPO. Is it formalized? So by formalized we mean do you have a process and do you have an official communication? Do you have a communication and exchange but they are not formalized? Or you don't have any contact? Or this is not applicable? So please let us know what's your experience. So maybe we can see what's the result, the question. Okay, so we see that most people have a non-formalized relation, then formalize, which is not far away actually from what we have seen in the survey. So we can immediately make the comparison with the survey when we see that if, if we combine the, the formalized contact with the non-formalized contact, we have a total of 86%. So this is really in line with the results we have today. So that's interesting. And maybe it would be good to hear from the experts what is concretely happening in their organization. And I suggest that, sorry, we will not do ladies first, we will start this time by Ralph. What is happening at, at BASF and how do you interface and contact, what are your contacts concretely with, with the DPO? Basically, we audit the DPO from an audit point of view because he's second line of defense. Yeah. So we apply the three line of defense model and of course, we look into the implementation and the effectiveness of the data protection, data privacy management system. So this is the audit point of view. But basically, it's legal compliance and risk management which means for our audit planning, of course, data protection is always one part of our audit activities. So we have to build it into the organization and from audit point of view to build in our audit planning. So it's a part of it, it will part. As we look into other compliance aspects. So then we don't need a formal way to act. We do it case by case, in specific cases coming up. We do it as part of our audits and sometimes we audit the compliance officer and the data protection officer. Thank you. Maybe just to add something, you, you mentioned before that you have a European DPO. So yes. what's, what is the impact of this European organization on the interaction actually? So they got a network basically starting from the companies because always it's legal entity based, but they got a network and there's a clear process with regards to information, exchange, best practice, and in case of notification to be done, 72 hours in case of a breach, for example, there must be structure, main establishment, authority needs to be notified very, very fast. So these processes are built in by implementing the European dimensions, and of course, the effectiveness of this design would be subject to an audit, for example. Thank you, interesting. What's your experience at uh, EnergyNet, Lynn? How, how do you interface with the DPO and how do you interact? I mean, the DPO and, and ourselves are in the second line of defense. Uh, we have common interests. So, but we fit, uh, I think the result, the survey result uh, very much. At the moment, we don't have any formalized um, exchange with the DPR uh, risks. Uh, beforehand, under the implementation, we did have uh, a very formalized uh, working group implementing uh, 
um, the, the work of the PPO and the GDPR risks. Uh, but I must admit, and uh, now it's not formalized, but I think it's a good recommendation to, to do a formalized uh, update with the risk manager. Thank you. I suggest that we go to the next question, please. So the, the next slide. So in your organization, who is in charge of reporting to the board about data privacy matters, including, of course, the GDPR aspects? Is it the DPO, the senior management, the chief risk officer, or the chief audit executive, or maybe any other function? So please let us know what's your experience. Okay, so maybe let's go through the results of the polls. So the report to the board is made, first of all, by the DPO for 49%, then by senior management. I don't think it's a big surprise. And then the CRO and Chief Audit Executive only for 5%. So I think it's interesting to compare with the result of the survey. Again, we, we are really in line, and, and I think this is, this is quite logical, but I would like to hear about the experts to know more concretely how the reporting is done, if there is some connection with you as risk manager or chief audit. Of course, Len, you have both hats, so you are in a special situation. But what would be the best practice that you could share with the audience today? So, Len, please let us know. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And the, the detailed report from the DPO is coming from the DPO uh, twice a year. Uh, however, having said that, risk, we as a risk management team are responsible for the total risk reporting. So uh, we would also uh, take GDPR risk into our risk mapping if it's significant enough and uh, align that with the risk of our risk uh, picture. Uh, doing that, um, we have, um, have checked with the board uh, their wishes of uh, the total risk reporting, their expectation. So we had a workshop with them, asking them, what do you need from the risk management and including uh, GDPR risks, but only if they are significant, they would go uh, into to that. And I think the collaboration between both risk managers and the DPO and especially with the internal audit function it's very important to make sure that we fulfill the, the value that we can give in both the second line of defense in collaboration with the third line of defense um, where Ralph is sitting. So um, we assess GDPR risks like any other risks. Uh, we work with uh, seven types of risk, dedicated seven types of risk, which the board have actively agreed to and uh, works with and GDPR risk, uh, just the risk within compliance, like other compliance risks. Thank you, Lynn. What is your experience at, at BASF? Because there you have a second line, a third line, they are separate. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal together with the DPO, but also with the risk manager? First of all, as Lynn mentioned, and can only, it's part of legal compliance part of risk assessment as any other risk too and this needs to be amalgamated and put to senior management from a pure data protection point of view we purposely have implemented a direct line from the dpo to the ceo so the functional reporting goes directly purposely to the ceo to board and supervisory board to keep the independency and the direct information flow up and running 
So it doesn't matter from an organization point of view where somebody resides, but the line from the function goes directly to the board. So this message is really conveyed directly, no filter in between. But nevertheless, there must be a combined risk assessment and a combined overall view to senior management, that's for sure. So it's a kind of network collaboration approach, but from the PPO point of view, design element direct reporting is crucial. And you will look from audit point of view exactly this functional separation, design implementation, and effectiveness, and this line must work to this year. Any other recommendation, Lane, based on, on your experience in terms of maybe teamwork and exchange between risk management and internal audit to get one voice to the board, or how, how do you recommend this collaboration? Uh, collaboration is, is always good, and in this case, uh, very important. Uh, I think my recommendation would be to assess GDPR risk in the same way you assess any other risks so you can align them uh, and and you can give the board value for their decisions to be made so it's just another risk like any other and and maybe a, a side question for you ralph based on your experience at european level do, do you see issue that are bigger in some countries than others, or, or do you see something quite similar based on your experience in, in, in this uh, reporting to the board and, and, and this overall assessment of the GDPR regulation? From BSF point of view, no, because we put it to European level, there's only one reporting line to the CEO. That's clear. What I do see, of course, is different, let's say, interpretation on local level. What needs to be assessed in which way? But this goes to do the same rules apply? Yes. Do the same authorities have the same understanding, interpretation? That's, of course, progress thing. So it's more about the uncertainty and the common understanding on the authority side. And with this, the main establishment concept on European level helps very much. Because then you align with the representative of the authorities, with the DPO, and they, in their network, have to figure it out. So that's why we have chosen the European approach purposely. So it's the uncertainty more than the reporting line. Okay, thank you. Interesting, I think. Let's move, if you don't mind, to the next question, please, that is related to the internal auditors that are on the line today. But I think that risk manager can also give their opinion. It's always interesting. So do you foresee that uh, the GDPR-related engagement will become recurring audits in your audit plan for the coming years and, and, and especially for 2020 that's coming now? Yes, no, I don't know. Maybe we can see the results, please. Yes, by 66% and no by 15%. So if we compare with the survey and also with the interview that have been conducted, we see that uh, indeed uh, GDPR is part of the audit plan. It was already for some of the people in 2018. It is for sure in 2019 and then it declines a little bit in, in 2020 so that was uh, interesting results from from the survey actually and and i think what is also uh, interesting is to see that it, it's part of the audit plan but in different aspects so governance is the number one general design is number two implementation number three and performance and effectiveness is the number four so what I would like to ask to, to Ralph is, uh, based on your experience, what is the methodology that you use to audit uh, GDPR? What are the main aspects? And also another question for you in terms maybe of training of, of the people. Uh, how did you manage it at BASF to make sure that your auditors are aware of all these aspects of new regulation? Mm -hmm. Uh, let me comment first on the results. 
This is a typical project phase, a kind of life cycle. The hot phase was May 2018, a lot of uncertainty. From the audit point of view, then you audit 1890. You have a peak on the setup, on the structure as such, purposely. Yeah? Does it work? Do we have a setup? Later, you follow a traditional compliance management audit, design of compliance, implementation, and effectiveness. An external auditor would do the same, by the way. So one of the big fours would exactly apply this one. So we see a life cycle coming from project to an ongoing topic, a risk to be monitored in the normal course of the business. And of course, we have two dimensions for corporate audit. One dimension is how do we audit, which means knowledge about GDPR with the auditors. And we follow this design, implementation, effectiveness. And of course, COVID audit is subject to such kind of regulations. So how do we perform our activities fully aligned with the data protection regulations? So we have to both aspects to be considered while performing audits. And training in both directions and sensitivity is essential. Thank you. Lynn, any experience you want to share that you have seen from the internal auditors in your organization? Uh, I completely agree with Ralph. It's like a life cycle. When, when something new is implemented, you will see focus on it. As a, as a risk manager, what we do uh, to keep focus on, on different kind of subjects, including GDPR, every quarter we pick a subject, a main subject, which is the one we go out in the business with and asking them to make sure that we don't forget any subject, like a compliance on our own risk management. So we are really, um, we are relying on the internal audit, but we are ourselves very much into looking for handling new subjects, including GDPR. So it will probably be a subject within the next or the next quarter where the tendency probably will be um, more calmness around it than uncertainty as it was in the beginning. Thank you, great. So maybe it's time now for Tiffany to see what's going on with the risk manager. So we will see in a couple of seconds the results. Okay, so for 68% of you, it is a compliant risk, uh, followed by a reputational risk for 14%. And then operational, then strategic and financial. Here we have quite a difference from the results of our survey, which we can see on the next slide, where we see that basically it's more a reputational risk for the respondents to our survey. Secondly, it is a compliance risk, then operational, then strategic, and only, financial, uh, only finally, it's a financial risk. So this was also quite a, um, one of the surprise from the findings of our survey, that meaning that the fines, the fact that you can be fined if you not, do not comply with the GDPR, it doesn't seem to be um, one of the higher risk for the organizations. Um, Lena, Ralf, would you like to comment on the results? Uh, yes, uh, it is very surprising. Um, within Energinet, we define uh, GDPR as a compliance risk. 
And uh, of course, uh, when we evaluate it, uh, the consequences are mainly uh, assessed on the reputational uh, level, uh, but we do uh, define it as a compliance risk. Um, so uh, yes, it surprises me uh, a, a bit, I must say, because I also assume that a lot of companies, maybe not public owned, would tend to, to describe them as financial risks. Um, so it is a bit surprising. I would agree to Lynn's assessment because the hype was always about the penalties and the high uncertainty. This was the driver and basically everybody was scared about what's coming. Nobody knows exactly we, the assessment of the authorities will happen or not. Um, we have learned the authorities are pretty pragmatic and as long as you're heading to the right direction and really show the efforts and have a solid baseline, things are more or less okay and to be improved. But even the authorities need to find their way. So this later implementation turned out in a more pragmatic than dogmatic way, which may reflect this a little bit. Nevertheless, it depends on the industry you're in. If you're in pharmaceuticals, medical stuff and such kind of things, of course, data breach is a high, high risk reputation and the business license. Uh, chemical industry, maybe not so much. So it depends a little bit. And this, your setup is very important here. But nevertheless, please keep in mind, really the internet Giants and all such kind of industry with a single please agree everything sanctioned. So not subject to data privacy, data protection. So, but if your choice is only you click off or you can't use it, this is not really free will. So this is a bit biased, but it's not subject to such kind of regulations. So it depends which business you're in and what kind of formal tick off you make it from your customer or from the user. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Um, and in our survey, we have also asked uh, other specific risk management questions. And you can see on the next slide some of the results. So we can really see that the majority of the risk managers have really incorporated data privacy risk in their existing risk mapping and risk assessment. And when we have asked also how and if they had evaluated the threats arising from the GDPR implementation, for 76% for of them it was the case. And um, the, some of them were, a, a third of them have financially quantified the threats and proposed mitigation measures. And 44% of them have um, regarded, um, looked at the frequency and the severity without a specific financial quantification. So more, more performing a qualitative assessment. Um, Lena, what have you done uh, for the GDPR? Yeah. Um, as I mentioned before, we define it as a compliance risk. And uh, we assess it uh, basically in the same way as any other risk, also financial. But of course, it's a, a qualitative uh, assessment, but we are able to align it with financial consequences. So what we are doing in, in the way we are handling it is saying this and this impact equals an amount. So therefore, it should have the same attention. So we are not saying it has a specific value. We are just saying if something hits us uh, around 100 million euro, we try to assess it in the same way on the GDPR. If something hits us with a severity equivalent to 100 million euro, we should do something. So we align assessments of qualitative and quantitative risks. Um, it, I think it depends on which kind of uh, company you are in which business you are in, if, if you can do that in that way, or if you have to do it always economically. For, for, for us as a public owned company, it's very important to assess our uh, reputational uh, exposure and our image uh, because of the role that we have in the society. So I've I think it, it's working quite well with the with the GDPR as well. Okay. 
And, and Ralph, um, can you share how it's being done at BASF? From a risk management point of view, basically the same approach. And if you really have to show the maximum threat, of course, you go according to the law, regulations, and show the turnover multiplied by whatever, and you get a huge figure. But this is the maximum risk. The challenge is really to assess because there is no empiric data on penalties of authorities. You simply don't know. So what will materialize or not, um, this you can't, as of today, you can't judge. First, secondly, I'm not sure this should be a kind of cost-benefit assessment, what you need to do on data protection or not. So we rather go for solid structures to be implemented in a workable condition as a main focus to avoid any penalties. But the driver is let's have a proper organization, a proper setup, and a proper effective implementation. And then, of course, penalties to be minimized. And we still do not know what will be, in some cases, the reaction of authorities, but we'll figure it out. If you can prove you have prudent diligence, design implementation, and do quality assurance, for sure, this is a totally different discussion from risk point of, point of view, too, uh, to talk to authorities that have nothing and getting asked what they've done the last few years. So we focus more on the proper design implementation and living data privacy, data protection, then talk about does it make sense to do a little bit more or less in risk. So we would avoid such kind of cost-benefit consideration. This is not a profit, it's legal compliance. Okay. Thank you. So now we will move on to the next question. Mm -hmm. Yes. So what are the challenges of GDPR implementation in, in your organization? So just to launch the debate and, and to hear from the experts, these are the results from the survey. So uncertainty and complexity was the number one by 30%. Innovation R&D 25%. Workload 17. Relation with third parties 14. And relation internally 14. Based on, on your experience, uh, Lynn, what have been the top two challenges for the implementation of GDPR in your own organization? Um, I think our, our top challenge was the uncertainty. Uh, the uncertainty about the complexity in, in this new game about GDPR. So in, um, in the implementation phase, um, I, I feel there was a lot of uncertainty how to handle it, how, how big is this kind of workload, how do we implement the processes. So I think there was a lot of um, colleagues uh, sort of thinking, what, what are we going to do uh, now and in the future? So that's mainly what I felt at the beginning. But after a, a, a short while, describing the structure, just doing the hard work, the processes, agreeing on what we are talking about, uh, education uh, within the company, I think uh, the uncertainty has sort of calmed down. Maybe back to what Ralph said before, it's a life cycle when you meet something new and you have to implement it. So if I look at our business today, uh, I wouldn't uh, describe it as uncertainty any longer. It's, it's basically implemented. I think it's going well. Questions will arise from, from colleagues within uh, uh, related to GDPR, but questions are also uh, raised uh, in different kind of subjects. So uh, I, I think we are in a different period now and trying to work with it and as a Thank risk you. manager it's just another uh, interesting uh, thing to handle. Thank you very much and, and, and what about BASF? Uh, is it business as, as usual now? Is it integrated in the business or are you still facing some challenges with this uh, regulation? And yes. if, if uh, yes, <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm not talking as the DPO, but as risk manager, uh, I think there's still some way to go. But I think this major uh, uncertainty that was at the start uh, has has phased out uh, to a big extent. Yes. I think you're right, and, and this is also what, what we have seen in some of the answers that, that we have from the survey and from the polls. And, and what is your point of view, Ralph? Are there still some challenges? Which ones? Of course, more than ever. It's no longer uncertainty and complexity. This will figure out there will be rulings of this workload was a topic for sure, and still to a certain degree, because everybody's learning, everybody's building up with things. The real challenge is about data protection on the one hand, new technologies business on the other hand. This getting more and more basically opening up because you can do lots of stuff, is it allowed or not? So what are the boundaries? What kind of data protection conform things you need to do to enable the business? E-privacy to come and such kind of stuff. So it's not the end point, it's a starting point. So to build in whatever you do, an element, a dimension, I would call it data protection, is part of best practice business. You can't afford not handle such kind of stuff in the future. And the challenge is really to have lots of creative colleagues from the business side to be told you can do it, but in a specific framework. So it's not a no, it's yes, but. And this sometimes is a challenging exercise because the dreams may be more than the regulations may allow. Yeah, and, and the but means some boundaries, and I guess this is this is not easy on a daily basis. Yeah. So, so time is running, and I think it's time now, Tiffen, to share the questions from the participants. So Yes, so we have received a couple of questions from the participants, uh, but feel free to, to leave your question in the chat box if you want also uh, to, to contribute to the discussion. So the first question um, is about uh, more SMEs. So what advice would you give to an SME owner? Are there the, are the same solution applicable? What adjustments? So do you have any uh, suggestions, like for instance, the DPO? Um, uh, it's true that there can be some exceptions for the SMEs. The DP, they don't need always to have a DPO. Uh, still, they need to protect, you know, to make sure that, you know, the personal data are well protected and they comply with the regulation. So what would you, um, what would be your advice? I may recommend the point is do you have the critical mass? Depends a bit on the business model you are in and the sensitivity of data, but can you do it in house or is the organization too small? You may better outsource it to a certain degree. And depending on the size, you may decide local or going European setup. But the challenge is the knowledge to keep updated with the developments and whether you can handle it in your organization or not, you have to purchase it. But it's part and applies to everybody. So you need to build in your process in your business this dimension for sure. Make or buy. It does need to be a, anywhere a, a training of the employees and a change in the mentality and the processes, which is something that all organizations independently, if they are small or big, need to go through. Absolutely. But if it, the point is how you're applying it, you can do it very bureaucratic, formalistic. Basically, having simply charts and templates and whatever. This is not required. Data protection depends on effective implementation. You need to live it only in practical terms. You can't do a great theory, but later it does not work in practice. So, you have to find a way in your organization, in your processes, you can build in and it works. You don't have to over engineer it, but the basic must work. So, keep it simple, keep it to the minimum. And have a proper setup and try to secure the quality. I think that's a good point. And avoid over engineering or get everywhere a lawyer in does not help. It must work. That's our learning basically. We keep it very low profile but effectively implemented. Okay. Lena, would you like to add anything? Yes, I think. Um... Uh, a risk management, uh, not only GDPR uh, risks, but risk management is about a culture. It's not really a specific job, it's a culture. So uh, you need to live it uh, 
uh, walk and talk it. And over engineering is, uh, in my view, the biggest mistake you can do. And I think uh, I, I would go so far and say I would think it would be the same on, on GPR. But um, it's a culture you have to, to live uh, as a risk manager. And uh, as I, I think I said before, I see GDPR no different as a risk manager. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a question of adapting the culture. So we have another question, which is, can you make GDPR and data privacy management a competitive advantage? This is an interesting question. Um, I think, may I try? Yes. <laughs> I think it's back, uh, back to Ralph saying, don't, uh, don't do a business case on it. Uh, I think you mentioned that before, Ralph. Um, I suppose some companies, uh, at least I heard uh, some talk about it, that you, you, you could make it a competitive advantage. You could also speculate in how high a risk tolerance you have on your penalties. That's the opposite way, right? So, but I think that's up to, um, to the ethics of the companies and their risk tolerance, but you, you probably could do it in a theoretical world. I just think the question is whether you want to do it. <laughs> Ralph, what, is you, what are your views? See, data protection, European style, may have the potential to get an export thing as best practice globally to a certain degree. So you talk about Europe cloud and such kind of stuff. The flip side of the coin is you see that regions separate themselves. There's no longer an internet, there's a kind of regional nets and gaining back power and trading power and such kind of things. So we can't separate this overall aspect from, let's say, data protection in our understanding. China got a completely other, other understanding with regards to data privacy. And people are happy to have this understanding in such kind of cultures. So it depends a little bit. But for Europe, I think it's a great achievement to have for entire Europe market the same understanding, the same competitive rules to be applied. And then it comes to reputation. If you're really a trustworthy vendor business partner, and you, yes, you can prove your trust, somebody can trust you, this data is identity. This, of course, as a trusted business partner, that's a value. So this yes. could be an advantage, yes, but it comes to reputation and risk to manage your reputation. And maybe because I see that the time is, is running, so maybe a, a last question. Um, how to influence regulators to reduce the uncertainty perceived? So you, you, you mentioned that now it's less, the period of uncertainty has been decreased and it's less of an uncertainty, but still, um, and it's what also I was to reveal, still uncertainty is quite high in terms of the challenges. Um, we don't know how the regulator, when they will come and check what, you know, uh, what will be, what they will ask and so on. So, um, what, how to influence the regulators to reduce this uncertainty? Um, that's maybe for us, Pascal, to, to respond yes. to this question. <laughs> I think so too, yeah. <laughs> to but maybe at national level as well, with our uh, association, member association, to, um, to make sure that I would say that at least that they are aware of what is being done that there's been a lot of efforts put by all the companies to comply, that definitely um, there is a willingness to be compliant and that there needs to be a dialogue between the regulators and the, the companies that are going towards it. Um, and um, so that would be one of my recommendation, but Pascal, uh, maybe you have... A uh, I will just add, I will just add a, one additional small point. I think what is also important for the regulator is, is to understand that business must go on, so they must not come with new rules, they, they must simplify them, so that's, that's I think, one point. And another point is, is more the focus on, on the different countries and the fact that today uh, the, the regulation has been applied differently in, in, in some countries, so which make the life very difficult for European groups and organizations, and, and that's 
that's uh, that's important to to make them understand that this is difficult to handle and that they should help us on, on this one so this is what comes on top of my mind for the moment but we will work on that Tiffany. that's for sure <laughs> ralph and lena would you like to react Ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, okay. but I can comment. Um, see, it's a learning curve. If you need authorities, they have a specific regime, a methodology, how to communicate, how to align. This needs to be applied in practical terms. We simply don't know, and this is kind of exercise going on. I'm pretty confident there will be sooner or later kind of bandwidth with interpretation, so you can more or less assess what is expected, what needs to be expected best practice implemented and then you're doing okay but that's a learning curve what we understand is if you have a proper structure and you do really diligent efforts to comply with the regulations even if you may have room for improvement this will be totally different if understood and judged then you have nothing so the worst case is you're not prepared you don't have nothing um, then of course you better get your things up and running right now but with a proper set up and the to continue strive to improve, I think we are pretty okay. Nevertheless, it would be very helpful. Authorities will find the same understanding on a common denominator. This would help to mitigate the risk. Okay. okay, so thank you. We will now move on to our last part of the webinar, which is about the recommendations, because as Pascal mentioned, we have also included in our report some recommendations. Mm -hmm. The objective is not to go through all the recommendations, but what we have asked our expert is really to stress one recommendation in the report that they think is uh, very important and to comment uh, on it. So, um, Elena, uh, which recommendation is for you, you know, very essential? Um, that's uh, working with the DPO working with the internal order uh, together with the, the risk manager um, this this collaboration between the dpo and the risk managers in the second line is extremely important and gives a very very valuable uh, basis for the work of the third line of defense internal audit so i think that the corporate governance the defense line model and a structured uh, working together way is very important. Okay, thank you. Ralph, what would be your top fully recommendation? Agree. I fully agree. Joint forces for joint risk assessment, sharing information, sharing risk, have an assessment is very important. From audit point of view, of course, you have to secure independency, so we can't consult such kind of things. Three lines of defense counts. But Data privacy as such, data protection, first of all, it's how you live it. So by design, you build into your organization is of essence. And then it's about design, implementation, effectiveness, control, basically. And sooner or later, finally, stay calm. Nobody knows it better. If you're prepared, you take the challenge, you take the risk, and you work towards this, and you talk to the experts, you talk to your authorities, for example, normally it works out. It's just one topic as other topics, part of risk management and compliance. It's legal compliance. Thank you, Ralph. Pascal, what would be your number one recommendation? I think I completely concur to what has been said, of course. Uh, collaboration, teamwork, joint forces, and, and one voice to the board. I think this is, this is important too. Okay, and, and for me, what I, I would also um, keep it for the European institution, we know that they're going to review the GDPR and they're going to publish an evaluation report in May 2020. And what FERMA and ECIAA will also try to convey in terms of the message is that the corporate governance is one of the factors which will make you know, the implementation, the compliance with the GDPR efficient. So, uh, uh, the, the three lines of model defense is, is, is important to keep in mind and the collaboration with the different actors is very important. So we, we, with this, we come to an end to our webinar. Uh, maybe, Pascal, you would like to speak about the next steps? 
Yeah, so, so maybe very briefly, so the next step will be next week, actually. We have already a meeting next week, FERMA and ECIA with uh, the DG Justice, so with the Commission, to, to present the report to them and to the people that will write the evaluation report. And, and together with, with FERMA, we, we plan to organize uh, an event next year to explain not just to the Commission, but also to some MEP what are our views and, and, and our challenge and recommendation that we have been discussing today and that are included in the report. So thank you to everybody for your input. And Tiffen, the floor is yours for the conclusion and the final word. Thank you, Pascal. So you can find on um, FERMA and ECIIA website uh, the report with all the details about the findings that we've been discussing today. Um, and I would like to, to thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, FERMA will continue uh, organizing such a webinars next year. The ones that we've been organizing this year were very successful. It was always an increasing attendance and, and high rating. So if you want to be kept informed about the, the topics of our webinars next year, uh, well, you are welcome to subscribe to our newsletter and you can find the link on the slides here. So thank you very much. And thank you. Have a nice end of the day. Thank you, and in advance, happy holiday to everybody shortly. <laughs>